When we started this church almost 10 years ago now, 10 years this coming March, our prayer at that time and our prayer continues to be, Jesus, we want to go where you're going. We want to go where you're leading us. And so because of that prayer, we started our church in a rather unconventional way. Unlike most churches that start, we didn't have a one, three, five, ten year plan. We didn't have any membership or attendance projections or budget projections. We didn't even know if we'd build a campus or not. We really wanted this to be an adventure of faith where we truly were seeking God's heart and going where Jesus wanted us to go. And so in this first nine and a half years or so of ministry, uh, our, uh, every day has sort of been like this open, camp, uh, open canvas filled with opportunities. Uh, we've been able to try things. We've been able to experiment. We've learned some things. And all along the way, God has surprised us with these very surprising God moments taking us places we never dreamed possible. Uh, the first of those God moments, of course, was the moment when God invited us to start a new church, which for me and Jan, anyway, came way out of the blue because we were at Community Church of Joy. I'd been there 22 years. We believed we were going to finish our ministry there. And then suddenly out of the blue, God said, ah, I think I'd like you to start a new church. And then God surprised us with providing Zuni Hills Elementary School three weeks before our first worship service when our other worship venue had pulled out on us. And then God surprised us by providing 9.5 acres of land free and clear. And then God surprised us by calling us to build a multi-million dollar campus in the midst of the worst recession any of us can remember with a congregation too small to build a campus this size. And God surprised us from the very beginning by asking us to give away 10% of all that we take in to give it away to other missions and ministries around the world. And so far, with uh, almost 10 years of ministry behind us, we've given away about $1.4 million. And we started with nothing nine and a half years ago. And that's a lot of ministry that's happened just through our tithing of what God has given to us over these last several years. So we've seen one surprise after another. And really, our first nine years or so of ministry has been a lot like the first nine years of childhood. It's been a time of adventure, a time of wonder, a time of really walking into various things and taking it all in and and just seeing what life unfolds for us. And my hope is that we never lose that childlike wonder. That our prayer will always be, Jesus, we simply want to go where you're leading us. And so I hope that we'll never become so over-programmed or so over-planned that we miss out on the surprising twists and turns that God has for us. Having said that, however, just as all people go through life stages, churches go through life stages. And just as children eventually have to move into puberty in order to get to adulthood, even churches move from childhood into puberty and eventually into adulthood. And that shift from childhood into adolescence and then into adulthood is a major shift for every congregation filled with all kinds of new possibilities. And so even though we don't want to lose this childlike wonder we've had these last nine years, the question we need to ask now as we start moving into puberty is this. Jesus, what does it look like for us now to follow you as teenagers, as adolescents, as we move into adulthood? Where do you want to take us? Now one of the privileges that I've had for the last five years is taking our junior high boys and their dads through a rite of passage program, and we have one for our girls as well. And early on in the rite of passage, we talk about a boy's developing brain, or we talk about the human brain. And uh, so this is your brain. Uh, Mine's a little bigger, but this is the the average brain. And this part of the brain, anybody know what this is called? The prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex of the brain is the thinking part of the brain, the decision-making part of the brain, the critical judgment part of the brain. This part of the brain doesn't fully develop until we're about 22 years old. However, the decisions and the habits and the actions that we develop in the course of our adolescence years shape that prefrontal cortex and set the agenda for the kind of adult that we will be for the rest of our lives. Those decisions, those actions sort of harden themselves in the prefrontal cortex so that we really set the agenda for our lives in our teenage years. And so I say to the boys, look, if you want to make a bunch of dumb decisions when you're a teenager, you'll be a dumb adult for the rest of your life. If you want to be 
irresponsible and lazy as a teenager, you'll be an irresponsible, slacker, lazy adult the rest of your life. And that's a long time to live like that. If you want to addle your brain with drugs and alcohol, you'll have a lush brain for the rest of your life. And it's a long time to live with a lush brain. But if you start making and developing good, wise decisions, if you begin to develop good, healthy habits, you start taking good actions, you will develop a prefrontal cortex that will transform you into a good, wise, decisive, noble man for the rest of your life. The decisions you make as a teenager will shape your life for the rest of your life. And that's where we are in our history right now. We've been following Jesus along the way as children, and now we're moving into adolescence. And the, the behaviors that we begin to uh, enculturate, the habits that we enculturate as a church, will set the agenda for our church for generations to come. And so what we do now, as significant as those other God moments have been, what we do starting now, is the most significant God moment in our history so far. Now, I know that you love this church like I do. I know that you want to see this church be significant long after we're gone. And so what we do today and what we start talking about these next several weeks about the kind of church God's calling us to be will set the prefrontal cortex and set the agenda for mission and ministry for years to come. So over the next several weeks now, we're going to talk about what that means. We're going to look at some of the major shifts that we as a congregation are going to make as we shift from childhood into adolescence, as we shift from building buildings to building the ministry, and as we set the agenda for that prefrontal cortex. And as I said in the e-grace this week, if you want to revolutionize your faith, if you want to take the lead in leading your children and grandchildren to follow Jesus... If you want to move out of neutral in your faith and experience a new energy and zest and vibrancy in your faith, if you want to be able to connect with your spouse and be comfortable talking about faith or be comfortable talking about your faith with your friends, if you want to be a part of a church that is going to shift into overdrive and move deeper into reckless grace, then you're at the right place at the right time. And over the next several weeks, we're going to talk about what that looks like. So tonight what I want to do is start a little bit with our mission statement. Uh, we've got it up on the, uh, the walls now. Our mission statement is following Jesus on the bold, reckless adventure of bringing grace to the world. And we're going to talk about what that means and that radical call to follow Jesus and some of the shifts that he's calling us to make that will set that prefrontal cortex and help us build a dynamic mission that builds dynamic followers of Jesus. And that means you. So our mission statement, which really is the DNA of this church, is following Jesus on the bold, reckless adventure of bringing grace to the world. And that mission statement is based largely on a passage from Luke chapter 9. And in Luke chapter 9, Jesus essentially drops a bombshell on his disciples when he describes for them the kind of Messiah or Savior that he's going to be. To that point, his disciples probably assumed that he would be the Messiah everybody else expected. That he'd be a conquering king, a conquering, conquering warrior who would defeat the Roman Empire and set up the kingdom of God and the Jews would live in peace forever. And Jesus told them that he was going to be a very different kind of Messiah. That he would be a crucified Messiah, a crucified king. That the way he was going to defeat enemies was by dying. And as the disciples tried to get their brains around it, Jesus then stunned them with this radical call. He said, whoever, if any, want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will save it. What does it profit them if they gain the whole world but lose or forfeit themselves. Now this is in the context of seeing people hanging on the cross. And Jesus says to them, I want you to take up the cross and follow me. Now that is an all or nothing call. With Jesus, there's no middle ground. You're either in or out. It is a radical call to radical obedience. And what Jesus is calling for here is a radical shift of the agenda of our life. That we shift away from whatever it is that we think gives us life and follow Jesus 
and see him as the source of our lives. It's a radical shift in the way that we look at life. Now, for each of us, that's going to look a little differently. And there are a lot of different shifts that we could tease out of that one statement. But let me give you two examples of what I think Jesus is saying to his followers in the 21st century. First of all, I think to take up the cross in the 21st century means that we shift out of the gear of consumerism and shift into the gear of grace or the gear of following Jesus. We live in a consumer-driven society. A society that tells us that our worth and value, our identity is found in what we consume, what we possess. And the more we possess, the greater our identity, the greater our happiness. And so we consume everything in this culture. We consume technology. We consume the media. We consume fads. We consume self-help books and self-help talk shows. Because consumerism tells us it's all about me. It's all about meeting my needs. So I need to consume and consume and consume in order to gain the whole world, in order to gain life. The problem, of course, course with consumption is if you consume something, (laughs) then you have to consume something more. So all of you who now have that iPad, uh, I mean that iPhone 6, and you're consuming it, you've consumed it for the last two weeks, right now you're going a little jittery because you have to have the iPhone 7, right? Right? And you look at the people who stand in line for three months to get a new phone, to consume phones. That's consumerism. And now in the 21st century, even religion has become a consumer option. We consume churches like we consume restaurants. And so today, the way that people tend to choose churches is, first of all, it's based on convenience. It's based on schedule. And then it's based on what it does for me. And as long as... You know, I'm getting something out of it as long as it's convenient, as long as they don't change up the worship schedule, the pastor doesn't say something I disagree with, I'll keep consuming that church. But should something happen that might hack me off a little bit or they change the schedule, it's not convenient anymore, I will stop consuming that church, I will dispose of it, I will consume the next church, or I'll leave the church and consume something else. And so what our culture tells us is that life is found in consumerism. That we find the world, we gain the world through consuming and through possessions. Our identity is found by the toys that we have and by the lifestyle that we live. But again, the problem with consumerism is the more you consume, the more you need. And while we may gain the world, consumerism robs us in the end of our souls. And rather than finding life, we lose it. And deep down inside... We all know it. Even though we're all victims of consumerism, we know it deep down inside. And then Jesus comes along with this radical invitation and says, look, life isn't found in gaining stuff for yourself. Life is found when you give everything away to me. When you surrender it all to me. Because when you lose your life, that's when you find it. Now that's a radical call. That's a radical shift. Here's another one. It goes along with it. I think that when Jesus calls us to take up the cross and follow, he's asking us to shift from the gear of giving to the gear of generosity. Now, this may seem a little bit like splitting hairs because giving is good and giving is always good. But Jesus here is calling us to something really radical. He's calling us to a lifestyle where we recognize that everything that we have, everything that we are, belongs to him, and it's used in his service to save the world. Generosity is a lifestyle. Giving is an action. Generosity looks at life through the lens of God's grace. Giving tends to look at life through the lens of need. Generosity tends to look at life through the lens of God's abundant provision where what happens with giving is we we tend to look at life through scarcity. Where are people missing things and how can I fill in the gaps? Generosity keeps us open to the surprises of God where giving tends to focus us on what we have and what I think I can do in my budget or in my time schedule to help. Giving is a one-time event or action where generosity is a lifestyle that happens 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, those of you who've been here for a while, you know I don't like to drop names. I'm not that kind of guy. Um, But for the sake of the story, I want to drop a name for you. My my close personal friend, Noel Paul Stuckey. Anybody ever heard of Peter, Paul, and Mary? 
All right, some of you young guys, is Connor still here? Uh, he has no idea what I'm talking about. But Peter, Paul, and Mary, they were really huge back in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s and whatever. And uh, Noel, uh, his real name is Noel Paul, um, usually in his concerts he would do this little comedy thing about how we view life. And so this was many, many years ago, and he used magazines as a metaphor. He said, it used to be that we had a magazine called Life. And then they came out with a magazine called People. And then they came out with a magazine called Us. And he said, what's next, a magazine called Me? And he was right. You ever seen the magazine called Self? Yeah? Self magazine. We have iPhones, iPads, iWatches eyewear, icons. We have all kinds of eyes. We live in an eye society. And what Jesus is calling us to is something radically different. He's calling us to shift from giving to generosity, to shift from consumerism to grace, to shift from I to we to us to people to life and to the world. Now those are radical shifts. It's a very, very different way of living life. And for those of us who are followers of Jesus, deep down we know that there's grace to that because Jesus always invites us into grace. And if he says we find life that way, then that's where we're going to find life. But even though we sense there's something right about it, it's still not easy, is it, to live that kind of life? It's not easy to make those kinds of shifts. When I was 15, I learned how to drive a car, and it was an automatic I had no idea how to drive a stick shift. I had no reason to drive a stick shift until I got into college. And at Christmas time, my roommate and I and his girlfriend were going to drive home from Seattle to Minnesota, and then after Christmas, drive back from Minneapolis to Seattle. And we were going to do the kamikaze flight, meaning we were going to just drive straight through some 45 hours. So if I was going to help drive, I had to learn how to drive a stick shift. So my roommate tried to teach me, and it was not easy. For whatever reason, I could go from a dead stop into reverse, no problem. But for whatever reason, I could not get from a dead stop into first gear. I would grind the gears, the thing would stall out on me, it would jerk and lurch until it finally kicked in. I could go backwards, but I had a heck of a time trying to move forwards. But once I got into first gear, it was really easy to go into second gear and third gear and 12th gear and 14th gear or whatever they had, six, six gears. This was a Toyota Celica, so maybe had two gears, all right? So once I got into first gear, the other gears were easy. And that's a lot like our spiritual life, isn't it? It's a lot like this call of Jesus. He's got these shifts for us, but they just don't come easily. It's a lot easier in the Christian life to go in reverse. And maybe you've had this happen in your life. Let's just take worship for an example. Uh, for whatever reason, you decide to take a weekend off. You want to sleep in, you're tired, you've had a hard week, great. Next weekend rolls along, and you know what? That was kind of, let's just do one more. And then just one more. And before you know it, it's been a year since you've been in church. And it happens just like that because it's so easy to shift into reverse. Or, if you're new to this whole Christian thing, it's really tough going from a dead stop into first gear. Try getting into the habit of worship. Try getting into the habit of reading the Bible or praying. There's, there's stalling and you're grinding and, and there's all kind of lurching and jerking and it's just so hard to get going. But once you get into first gear and you start getting the rhythm of following Jesus as he starts calling us deeper, it actually in many ways gets easier. Because now you're moving forward. And so discipleship is at the heart of who we are, following Jesus, making these shifts so that Jesus becomes our priority. And so as we start moving now into our adolescence years, we are going to make some significant shifts as a congregation to empower us and equip us to make this shift into following Jesus on the bold, daring, reckless adventure of bringing grace to the world. We've built the campus. We've built the infrastructure, and now it's time for us to develop that prefrontal cortex and get solidified our mission of following Jesus. 
So what I want to do tonight as we close, very quickly, is introduce you to a major shift that we're going to make. And the next four weeks, we're going to tease it out. So when you first hear it, you're going to say, that, that's it? But trust me, as we go deeper with it, and as we begin to practice it, and as you begin to practice it, it's going to change your faith. It's going to change your family. It's going to change your relationships. It's going to change this church. And it's going to begin to change the community around us. It's that big. So again, I'm overselling it because it's, going to, it's not going to sound all that great. But once we get there, it's going to be radical. So here it is. We are, now as we shift from children into adolescence, we are going to shift from the gear of church to the gear of church plus home. And let me very quickly tell you what I mean by that, and then we're going to spend the next several weeks talking about how that's going to change your life. 40, 50 years ago, maybe longer, many, many churches across the United States of America made a significant shift in ministry. And that was a shift away from the church and the home partnering together to build faith to the church becoming the primary source of faith development. It used to be that parents were the primary nurturers of faith in the home, and grandparents and then husbands and wives spent time talking about faith together, and friends would get together and talk about faith. And the church would equip them to do that, and the church would provide a little faith nurturing. But the home was the primary place of nurturing faith. And then about 40, 50 years ago, the shift happened where we began to outsource the formation of faith to the church, and we as parents lost the art of raising our kids to follow Jesus. We as grandparents lost the art of talking about our grand, to our grandkids uh, about it. We, we as couples lost the comfortability of, of, of talking about Jesus together and praying together because we were outsourcing it to the church. And the problem is, it doesn't work. Because you can't build disciples in an hour a week. Or now, the average person, the average regular tender goes to church 1.4 times a month. Can't be a disciple in 1.4 times a month. It's just impossible. Because faith can't be put up on the shelf Monday through Saturday and then dusted off, taken out for an hour, and then we expect it to energize us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's why Jesus says to take up the cross daily. And the only way that we can take up the cross daily is if faith happens in the home daily. And that's where disciples are made. That's where transformation takes place. And that's how great churches are built. When churches partner with households and households partner with churches to build followers of Jesus who shift from consumerism to grace, who shift from giving to generosity, who shift from death to life. And so over the next several weeks, we're going to talk about what that looks like. We're going to talk about some of the tools that we as a church can provide you so that you can talk to your kids, your grandkids, so you can talk to each other about faith, so that your home can become a little mini church. And we begin to see Jesus taking us into gears of faith we never dreamed possible. For the last nine and a half years, Jesus has surprised us with some remarkable shifts. A shift from being in a large church, community church of joy, to starting a church from scratch. The shift from having no place to worship to a school, to the shift to being given land and building a campus. And all of those shifts have been important and vital, but no shift is more important than what we do right now by setting our prefrontal cortex to become a church of little churches called households, where together, every day, we take up the cross and we learn what it means to follow Jesus. So next weekend, we're going to lay the foundation. My friend Mark Holman is going to come. Uh, your staff and your board has been reading his book called Church Plus Home, and he's going to come in and he's going to share with us a vision for what this looks like. And I promise you, it's going to energize you, and it's going to give you hope and encouragement. And so here's what the weekend's going to look like. On Saturday morning from 9 to 1230, he's going to do a leadership development thing for anyone and everyone who wants to come and really get in on the ground floor of this and learn what it's all about. So you're all invited to come. We received a grant from the East Valley Lutheran Thrift Store for this, so it's all free. Uh, in the evening, next Saturday night, he'll preach, and he'll just sort of lay a foundation about why the home, the household, is the place for faith. And then afterwards, we'll have free pizza and child care so that parents can spend an hour with Mark and he'll begin to give you some tools, and grandparents as well, some practical tools that you can start to implement on Sunday morning. 
We'll do the same thing on Sunday morning. You'll preach at both services, and then after the 1030 service, you'll do the same seminar, free pizza, and so on. So I hope that you will make it a priority to be here next weekend. And if you're a parent or grandparent in particular, that you'll stay an extra hour next Saturday night or next Sunday after the 1030 service. And um, we'll be talking to all households, but we're going to start with parents and grandparents. And um, I've been doing enough reading and praying and talking with our staff to know that this is going to be a life changer, game changer for you and your family. And that's what's most exciting about it for me. So if you're ready to take your faith to the next gear, if you're ready to revolutionize your faith, if you want to get out of reverse, you want to get out of neutral, if you want to start taking leadership in your home and talk about Jesus and take up the cross daily, now's the time. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the invitation into this radical grace that changes everything. It is a call to grace. And it is a call that happens only by the power of your Spirit, but it isn't easy. There are so many life forces out there, crowded schedules and consumerism and, and budgets and, and tight timelines, all of that stuff that keeps us from really radically following you. And so now as we move into this new phase of ministry, I pray that this would be a discipleship moment for all of us, that we can set the agenda for the next decade, two decades, generations, where this becomes a church of little churches, households of faith, that quietly and profoundly change the world. You've brought us this far, Heavenly Father. We're eager to go where you take us next. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.